Welcome to the army and battle section of my greenskin guide. In this section we will be going over the entire greenskin roster and covering all of the unit's pros and cons, as well as compositions and formations in battle. Disclaimer, this guide is based on my personal experiences and opinions and is by no means the definitive way to play the greenskins in Mortal Empires. If you have a different strategy or want to add something to mine, please leave a comment down below. Now that's that way, let's get into the video. On the battlefield, greenskins generally rely on their melee prowess from both infantry and monsters, with little support coming from ranged and cavalry units. This would be okay were it not for the pretty poor leadership on most units, which means that your men will be running away until you get into the endgame. They also have a severe lack of anti-large damage and very fast units, meaning that enemy cavalry can easily give you the runaround and you can't really do anything about it. They do have a large selection of cav and chariots, but very few of them have the speed and strength to go up against many other cav units in the game. However, they do not have a large selection of ranged units at all, meaning you're going to be spamming a lot to get your damage types onto the field. Now, let's get into the units. Kicking off for the melee infantry are the goblins, and I have to say that they're about as good as they look. Their only redeeming quality is that they have shields, so are mildly more defended from ranged fire, but even if they don't take damage, they'll still be very low on leadership, so will run from almost anything before long. Fortunately for the rest of your army, they also happen to be expendable, meaning when they run away, no one is going to be two-faced. I would personally never bother taking them unless I'm playing Skarsnik since he gets them some bonuses. If you're going to insist on taking them though, then keep them in the front lines with heavy support from ranged and cavalry units to make sure they don't break or get wiped out immediately. Night Goblins are markedly better than regular ones, and it's just because of one reason. They keep their shields and poor leadership and expendability, but gain poison damage. Poisoning enemies makes bad troops into decent ones, since they don't have to do much damage or be too tough, and can just chip away at debuffed enemies until they break. They also have some stat improvements, but for me, poison is what makes them good. That being said, I wouldn't have a full lineup of these guys if I had a choice, as you will still need to do damage and they aren't exactly the best frontline fighters due to the leadership issue. I'd recommend taking a couple of them to be integrated into your frontline so that your more damaging troops have an easier time in battle, and I make sure to keep them spread out on the middle of the pack so that I can send them where needed. They come in two varieties, Standard and Fanatics. The only difference is the special range attack they get, Spinning Loons. When charging, it causes a couple of them to run ahead of the main pack and spin around doing some decent damage to anything caught in the way, and it can only be used once. It's always worth getting fanatics for this reason, as it just adds more to an already decent mid-game unit. Orc boys are the first of the larger green skins. They also have shields, so can do alright under some light ranged fire, but be sure not to let them get overwhelmed. Other than that, they're a solid frontline for the early game, and I replaced non-night goblins I had with these guys as soon as possible. This meant I was taking 4-6 to six of them depending on how many fanatics I was taking. In battle, I would keep them as a solid line while I supported them with ranged and cav units since they aren't huge damage dealers themselves. They also don't have the best leadership in the world, so will start to break if it isn't going their way from the get-go. This means it's worth keeping characters nearby to keep them topped up. Nasty Skulkers are something unique. They're kind of an assassin unit and are more suited to sneaky flanks than straight-up combat. They have vanguard deployments and stalk, so are great for starting in a hidden location before moving in for the kill once the enemy attention is elsewhere. They do decent AP damage, so can do some pretty hefty damage against most enemy units, as long as they stick around long enough, which they probably won't due to their poor leadership. If I'm taking them, I'll only bring a couple to place in a flanking location and use them once melee has begun to get some easy kills on ranged units, or just to surround the enemy lines and break them sooner. If you do decide to send them against something even remotely elite, it's definitely worth sending them together, as they just don't have the power to do it alone. The first of the Savage units are the Savage Orcs. They trade out the heavy armor for war paint that offers them physical resistance, making them super tough against anything that isn't magical, so they only have to be aware of spellcasters generally. They're damage dealers and also have the frenzy ability, meaning they can hit seriously hard, especially in the start of battle. If you can, then I'd recommend replacing any Orc boys with these guys as soon as you can, as they are superior in basically every way. They are arguably a more solid frontline and will do more damage over the course of the melee versus boys, but of course, it's still worth giving them support to ensure that the enemies are dealt with as swiftly as possible. As I said before, you do have to be aware of any enemy spellcasters on the field, especially if they can imbue magical attacks into enemy troops, as it will cause these guys to melt, but generally, they should be tough as nails and last a very long time. Orc biggins are basically what you'd get if you got boys and made them bigger, tougher and uglier. They do drop the shields but are bigger and harder, meaning that they have tougher armour and hit a lot harder too. They're damage dealers who you want to have in combat as soon as possible and you want them to stay there. I replace any savage orcs with these guys as they do more damage and are heavily armoured to stand up to almost anything. They are quite slow moving though, so you don't want to send them chasing after anything, but as the mid-game front lines go, they're pretty damn solid. 
They will hold for considerable amounts of time and do some great damage while they're there. They don't have much AP yet, so if they're going against anything too tough, they will need some support so that they don't get overwhelmed. Savage Orc Biggins are basically the same thing, but again, they drop their armor in favor for the more protective war paint. They function essentially the same, so another great choice for your mid-game frontline, but of course the physical resistance is very vulnerable to magical damage, and at the stage in the game that you get these guys, it's very likely that the enemy will have some mages to throw at them, so you have to pick your battles very carefully. I'd say they're interchangeable with regular biggins, so if you want to hedge your bets you could go half and half, but honestly, if you're going to only choose one, I'd say regular biggins are a little bit more versatile. Finally, we get to Black Orcs, and these guys are terrifying. They're incredibly armored and can take a beating from basically anything and come out relatively unscathed, so don't be afraid of basically any enemy infantry you come up against, as chances are, you'll be able to, at worst, hold out for a long time. They also deal a bunch of AP damage, meaning not only will they be able to outlast most opponents, they'll also be able to outdamage them pretty easily. They can shred through basically any infantry units, and that's a push can go against things like the Steam Tank if you really want, but it's certainly not their best matchup. I like to replace my entire melee lines with these guys and take six of them into the end game with me as their damage is unparalleled and they are an incredibly solid front line that will allow your other units to get into position and dismantle the enemy forces with ease. Unfortunately, all this heft causes them to be pretty slow, so it's best to keep them on guard mode if you can't keep an eye on them to ensure they don't go running to the opposite end of the map chasing retreating units. Starting for the ranged infantry, the goblin archers. Like their spear wielding brothers, these guys are pretty underwhelming. They have decent enough range and accuracy, but their damage leaves a lot to be desired and means you have to target mostly chaff if you want them to get any kills. They also of course have poor leadership, so if they even get a whiff of combat, then you bet they'll be running for the hills before they can even draw swords. Luckily, they're also expendable, so this won't bother your other troops half as much as it bothers you. In the very early game, when they're all the ranged options you have, I took two to four of them to support my melee lines, and I'd of course keep them at the back behind the front lines so that they can rain fire on the enemy from a position of cover. Night Goblin Archers are again very like to their melee siblings. They share the same weakness to armor and expendability, but they also gain the poison damage, which as I said before, is invaluable to your armies in the early game. They also gain vanguard deployments, so you can get some shots off from the start, or come from an unexpected angle later if you so desire. I would of course recommend replacing any Goblin Archers you have with these guys, as they don't even compare. I generally ignore the vanguard deployment and prefer to keep them at the backs of my melee lines to use them to target anything that is engaged in melee to ensure my troops have the constant advantage. It can be worth getting an angle on the enemy to ensure you aren't hitting your own units, so keeping these guys on the flanks is never a bad idea as long as you keep an eye out for enemy cav. As I said before, these guys are all about supporting rather than raw damage output, so they aren't likely to get many kills but will still be doing less obvious work. They also come in just two varieties. Standard and Fanatics. Fanatics, of course, gain access to these spinning loons to use just before they go into melee, which is a little strange as they shouldn't really be there unless it's a last resort. This can be worth doing a false charge to get them to use this before pulling back to continue ranged barraging. Orc Arrow Boys are basically the opposite of Goblin Archers. They have okay damage as well as better leadership and melee prowess whilst losing some of their accuracy and range. Their damage is better, but still not much to write home about. This paired with the poor accuracy makes them about as good at damage output as there is an added chance of friendly fire, so they're honestly about as bad as each other. All this aside, they're still a slight improvement, so I take a couple of them alongside a couple night goblins so I have some variety to the type of damage going out. Since they do have poor accuracy, I'd say keep these guys on the flanks of your back lines so that I can get around once melee begins and shoot into enemy backs with less chance of friendly fire. If they eventually run out of ammo, they can of course charge in and break some enemies in a little light melee. Closing out for the ranged infantry roster, we have Savage Orc Arrow Boys. They are very similar to regular Arrow Boys, but they of course drop all their armor in favor of protective war paint, making them super tough versus anything but magic. I choose to take these guys over normal Arrow Boys, as the resist tends to work better in their stage of the game. The use in battle is basically the same. Keep them on the flanks to shoot into enemy backs and sides before sending them in if turds really hit the fan, or they run out of ammo. Now we get to the largest variety for the greenskins, Cav. Kicking off are Goblin Wolf Riders. They're shielded, so can take a little bit of a beating from most ranged sources, but of course, it's best to keep them on the move to ensure they don't get overwhelmed, which is pretty easy. Lucky for them, they are super fast, so if they're on the move, it can be very hard for the enemy to hit them if they're moving evasively. I'd say bringing a couple of them in the early game will be plenty for outmaneuvering enemies and getting some easy kills on weaker ranged units. In battle, I of course keep them on the flanks, since they aren't the best in melee even against ranged units, I'd say it's best to keep them together to surround and gang up on most units to ensure that they are wiped out. Their speed also makes them great at running down retreating units, which is never a bad thing if it means you can ensure they don't come back. They come in two varieties, Standard and Archers. 
Archers obviously get bows and can sack from range as well as having the option to charge, but I wouldn't recommend it. They're used essentially the same, so you keep them on the flanks and use them to shoot into enemy backs, but since they are weak versus armor, it's worth picking your targets carefully to ensure the damage is getting through. I take a couple of each with me in the early game as the utility and variety of damage is something worth using. Forest Goblin Spider Riders are up next, and they swap the super fast walls for slower but tougher forest spiders. They're also shielded, but again, don't want to be left out in the open, as they will still get taken apart by even the weakest of ranged units. They do lack some of the charge that wolves have, but they make up for it with their betting melee stats and of course poison damage. This allows them to take on units that would otherwise be out of the question, and it also makes sure they're running or wiped out before long. They also come in two varieties of melee and archers, and I'd always say replace your wolves with these guys, as the poison attacks just make it easier on your entire army, especially when you can be affecting four units minimum at once. Now for something a little different, we have Knight Goblin Squig Hoppers. These guys are honestly phenomenal for their stage in the game. They have AP damage with a bonus versus infantry, so are amazing at taking on both ranged infantry and charging the backs of enemy melee and doing some considerable damage to either. They also have poison attacks, so will have that huge advantage giving them even more of an edge no matter what they're against. To top it all off, they also have vanguard deployments, so you can get right in the enemy face or catch them out on the flanks, depending on your needs. I of course would say replace any melee spider riders with these guys, as the damage outputs and versatility is superior in every way. In battle, you of course want to keep them on the flanks or hide them if you can, and once melee is established, get into the enemy back lines and dismantle as many ranged units as you can before coming back to assist the melee troops and clean up. Orc boar boys pretty much do what they say on the tin. They're orc boys on boars, and they work as you'd expect. They are the fastest, but can hit pretty damn hard if you send them after the right targets. They do have shields, so are marginally more protected from ranged fire, but as usual, you don't want to keep them sitting still long enough to be targeted. They also have AP damage with a bonus versus infantry, so can do pretty well against anything smaller than themselves, as long as they don't get surrounded, and can get off a good initial charge. If squeak hoppers aren't cutting it for you, then these guys can replace them, but it's really up to personal preference. Since they don't have any vanguard, you want to follow the standard flanking strategy that I've explained a bunch by now, so I won't repeat it again. Savage Orc Boar Boys are very similar, so I won't spend too much time. They of course drop these shields and armor in favor of the war paint, which makes them a little faster and more damaging in melee, and the ability to focus all of their attention on hitting rather than shielding. If you can, then I'd say these guys are better than regular boar boys, as long as you avoid any magical source of damage, and make sure to get good, safe charges off. They of course follow the same strategy too, so it's pretty straightforward. Orc boar boy biggins are again what they see in the tin, biggins on big boars. They also deal armor piercing damage, but now they have a bonus versus large, so are better suited to cavalry duels or going after anything bigger that the enemy might bring. They aren't going to go toe to toe with a steam tank or anything, but they can take on some knights fairly well as long as they don't get surrounded. They are of course bigger and harder, so have more armor and more damage output than their little brothers, but the use is essentially the same that I've said a load of times. Finally, there is of course a savage variant which drops armor for war paint, and a few stat changes, and to be honest, either one is totally acceptable and it can be used interchangeably of each other depending on what you're going up against. The use is also totally the same, so I won't get into that, but you always have to be aware of the magical damage from every source as it can totally shred them if you're not careful. Goblin Wolf Chariots are the first of only two chariot units available to the Greenskins, and they're a ranged unit. They deal decent enough anti-infantry damage, so are great at getting around and firing into the backs of melee and ranged troops alike. They lack some of the speed that regular wolf archers have, but their damage is better, so it's really a trade-off of what you need most. I'd say two of them can be used interchangeably, with wolf or spider archers depending on what you need. In battle, you of course can deploy them ahead of your army to get off some early shots, before looping back around once melee has begun to fire into the flanks for the rest of the battle. If they run out of ammo, they are okay for some light charging, but try to keep them away from sustained melee where you can, as they just won't last. The Orc Boar Chariot is very like the Orc Boar Boys. It has AP anti-infantry damage, as well as a little bit of armor to make them a little tougher to hit. This combined with a small unit size means it's a little harder for enemy ranged units to hit you, allowing you to move more freely around enemies in battle. Since they are melee, you want to get them around to charge enemy ranged infantry if you can, to shut them down and give your other troops the best chance. They can also do well charging the backs of the front lines, as long as you make sure that they don't get stuck, as they won't last long when surrounded due to the larger hitbox. Overall, they are a great unit and can be interchangeable with boar boys, and even bigger than boar boys. It all just depends on your playstyle. Kicking off for the monsters for the greenskins are the squig herd. They are what you get if you take away the night goblins from these squig hoppers, and it shows. 
They have the same AP anti-infantry damage, but they miss out on the poison, which we all know can have a huge impact in battles if used correctly. They also have the Rampage trait, meaning they can go out of control if you aren't careful, and let their health and leadership get too low, which can happen quite easily since there isn't heaps of it to begin with. Nevertheless, they're a great unit to have before Night Goblin Hoppers, so a couple of them will do wonders for you in the early game. In battle, they function basically the same as some weaker cav units. You want to send them to flank around weaker enemy infantry, and possibly to surround them to ensure you don't get outmatched, and rampage into the middle of something too tough. Trolls are up next, and they're our first real large units. While they aren't the toughest, they do have armour piercing damage, and their sweeping attacks can cause some serious damage if they get into the enemy lines. Unfortunately, they are large hitboxes, so end up being magnets for ranged attacks and melee swarms, so you have to be careful when using them to ensure you don't get overwhelmed. Their poor leadership means that they will run pretty quickly if this happens, so you want to be sure to pull them out on your own terms instead to make sure that they aren't taking more damage than they need to. Luckily, if you do manage to get them out, they have regeneration, so can stand around in the back lines for a little bit while they get their health back before heading back for more. I take two of these guys as soon as I can, as they are invaluable in combat and work perfect with your frontline melee troops. In battle, you want to make sure they aren't going one on one with enemies as they will get hit far too much. Instead, focus on integrating them into your front lines so that they'll be more protected while still being able to do some good damage, and be sure to move them back regularly to utilise their regen. Giants are great. They are huge and do devastating AP damage, and get a bonus versus infantry, so are great for taking on entire units of elite infantry if you let them. Like the trolls, they are unfortunately easy targets for ranged units, but they have huge health pools and leadership, so can really take punishment for a while. They also cause terror, so anything they come up against is going to have a hard time staying on the field once they enter melee. I'd replace any trolls with these guys, as they are just better in every way, and can do the job much better for a longer time. As I said before, you can really send these guys to solo enemy melee units if you want, or you can have them assist your front lines if they need it. You do have to be aware that their sweeping melee attacks can hit your own units, so integrating them in your front lines can be a risk, that you have to judge if it's worth it. Of course it's worth taking out any ranged units that could target them as soon as possible, to make sure it's spending itself where it counts, so make sure to keep them safe as you can. The Arachnorok Spiders are closing for the monsters, and they are insane. They have AP attacks with a bonus against anything large, so any cav charges will be quickly shut down if they don't manage to get away. They're also armoured, so will shrug off nearly anything that gets thrown at them, and can stick around for a very long time. To stop it all off, they even have poison attacks, so anything they engage in melee will be debuffed, and even easier for the unit to eat for dinner. I take two of them into the endgame with me, as the elite's anti-large damage is unrivaled by anything else in the roster. In battle, I send them after anything large that can't outrun them, such as the steam tanks or luminarchs of Heish. Cavalry is possible, but you have to use other units to tie them down, so it's a little hit and miss, but if you can do it, then an enemy won't stand a chance. They have the same weakness as the giants in the large hitbox, so you have to make sure that if they do get targeted, your other units are there to silence the enemy and make sure the health is being spent in melee. Finally, we get to my favourite category, and unfortunately, it's a little empty. First up, we have the Goblin Rock Lobber. It fires AP missiles over a decent range, and can do some pretty good damage to clumps of enemies, even if they are pretty elite. Unfortunately, they are outranged by the dwarfs, so aren't the best, and in my experience, tended to be a little inaccurate and hit my own units a fair few times. Nevertheless, since it's the only option, I took 2-4 to four of them in the early game, so that I could make the rest of my army's job easier once they got nearer. I of course targeted whatever was most elite and clumped on the approach, and once melee began, I set some custom locations to aim at so I could minimise friendly fire as much as possible. Doom Dive Catapults are closing us out today, and they're actually pretty top tier. They also fire armour piercing projectiles in the form of insane goblins and windsuits. Since they are manned projectiles, they are guided so have fantastic accuracy even at max range, and can hit almost anything with pinpoint accuracy. I of course replace any rock lobbers with these guys, as they don't even compare. In battle, they are of course at the back lines, and are used to target whatever is most dangerous on the approach, and with the amazing accuracy, this can even be single characters, as they'll hit a good 80% of the time. They are also pretty good at taking out any large units such as steam tanks, so don't be afraid to target basically anything. Now we come to the regiments of renown. I'll call out each unit, what it's a unit of, and the differences they bring. The Warlord's Boys are a Knight Goblins unit, and gain improvements to Leadership, Melee Attack and Defense, Immunity to Psychology, and swap the Poison for Armor Sundering Attacks. The Eight Peak Loonies are a Knight Goblins Fanatics unit, and gain Leadership, Melee Attack and Defense, as well as a better ranged weapon, and no longer being expendable. The Crimson Killers are a Black Orcs unit, and gain Leadership, Melee Attack and Defense, as well as becoming an anti-infantry unit. 
The Rusty Errors are a Night Goblin's Archers unit and gain leadership, missile attack, melee attack and defense, as well as replacing poison with armor sundering attacks and no longer being expendable. The Moon Howlers are a Goblin Wolf Riders unit and gain leadership, melee attack and defense, as well as causing fear and not being expendable. The Durkit Squigs are a Night Goblin Squig Hoppers unit and gain leadership, melee attack and defense, as well as missile resist. The Broken Tusks Mob are a Orc Boar Boy Biggins unit and gain leadership, melee attack and defense, as well as encouraging nearby units. The Morgrub's Mangy Marauders are a Goblin Wolf Archers unit and gain leadership, missile damage, melee attack and defense, as well as immune to psychology, AP damage, and not being expendable. The Death Creepers are a Forest Goblin Spider Rider Archers unit and gain leadership, missile damage, melee attack and defense, as well as stalk and regeneration. The Teeth Robbers are a Goblin Wolf Chariot unit and gain leadership, missile damage, melee attack and defense, as well as Vanguard and the ability to hide in forests. The Arachnorok Queen is a Arachnorok Spider unit and gains leadership, missile damage, melee attack and defense, as well as being able to summon a unit of spider hatchlings. Finally, the Hammers of Gork are a Goblin Rock Lovers unit and gain leadership, missile damage, melee attack and defense, as well as blinding attacks. Now to go over my ideal balance composition for the endgame. I take 6 Black Orcs as my solid front line, and they'll be putting in a lot of work and taking the majority of the damage. 2 Giants and 2 Arachnorok Spiders to target infantry and large units respectively, 2 Savage Orc Boar Biggins to chase down anything large, and 2 Orc Boar Chariots for the infantry, 4 Doom Diver Catapults to rain hell for the whole battle and to snipe anything too tough, finally an Orc Shaman and Orc Warboss to support where needed. Now to go over the battle, I'll pass you over to Miles, take it away. Thanks Miles, okay here we go, as you can see I have the same uh, formation as I have, and I'm just going to let these guys come up and I'm just doing a little bit of a light artillery targeting. I'm just going to be aiming for the more armor targets, so the great swords here, especially those that are bumped up. Just going to try and get a bit of preliminary damage in before the melee begins. Now, since the uh, enemy does have quite a lot of artillery at the back here, a couple of Hellstorm rocket batteries and then a Luminarch of Heish, that's going to be a bit of a struggle. I already tightened a bit of my uh, cavalry, so I've decided to start moving them back. But as you can see, they got quite a few units because the Luminarch of Heish is super strong. I'm moving my cavalry out into the woods here. They do end up getting caught out by these guys, the Demogriff Knights, and get a bit pelted by the Hillstorm Rocket Batteries. Uh, what I was trying to do there is get around, as we uh, can see from most of these battles that, you, uh, that I do. I'm not very good at them. It's a little bit chaotic, but you know, I, I get the job done, and I only play a normal, so you know, it's all good. Okay, the uh, Demogriff Knights charged my Black Orcs here, so I move the Arachnorok Spider straight in there. I mean, she's kind of derping around a little bit, but eventually she will get in there, and these guys are running off. So, you know, she's basically done her job just by being there and scaring them off. Sending my Lord in against these Demogriff Knights because the Savage Orc Boar Boy Biggins can't really take that fight by themselves. Again, my Chariot's kind of derping out a little bit because, you know, I can't manage them all at the same time. Similar thing happened on the opposite flank. My Cavalry getting attacked by theirs. Send the Arachnorok in to scare them off. And now I am moving my melee lines up along with the Giants and the Spellcaster. Meeting their great swords. Black Orcs have no worries against great swords. They can take them out one on one pretty easily. Even two on one, you know, if they are supported by a mage or something, which of course they are. Got a fantastic foot of Gork coming in right here on these melee uh, ranged units. Sorry, there it is. I love that spell. We'll get into that a little bit more in a future spell guide. But that is a super good spell. It's basically like a nuke. Uh, not quite as strong, but it does do a hell of a lot of damage and can wipe out most units. Okay, the uh, Doom Divers still tagging the same things. Uh, I believe I do change them at some point, but you know, you can never do too much damage to Great Swords. You don't want those guys come back. Oh, a little bit of friendly fire then, my Black Orcs. I didn't see that in the uh, actual battle. Demogriff Knights here charging my Giants. It's not the best matchup for him, but it's certainly not the worst. I mean, it's just a single unit. They do have anti large damage, but you know, he's a giant. Look at him. He's just he's pacing a few of them every time he takes a swing. Their Temple Hoff Luminarch of Heish is for some reason going around. I think it's trying to get a shot on these Doom Divers and it just can't seem to work it out. I do eventually notice and send the Wizard after it and also a Spider or notice his chariot here. There we go. My Orc Ball Boy Biggins finally trying to make their way around along with the chariots here. The Demogriff Knights doing a great job at shutting me down. Around here, the Demogriff Knights still fighting the Black Orcs and my Lord, but you know they're not holding very long. Then me starting to break is quickly turning in my favor. 
just keep pushing the Black Orcs up and the Arachnorc Spider. I did notice this a lot in the campaign. The larger units, like the Spiders and the Giants, do tend to stop moving randomly. I'm not exactly sure what I was doing wrong. Like, I target them. Like, I'm pretty sure I've targeted him onto the uh, Luminarch there. But, like, it moves and then he just stops going after it. I'm not sure what's up with that. They're not on guard mode or anything. Just a bit weird. There you go. The Giants, both covered in blood. Both basically full health. So they are ready to just, you know, demolish anything that returns here. There is nothing that we have to worry about. The... Uh, artillery is exposed. I believe I'm going to send some of these melee units to go after him. You know, once we get a little bit further up, I just need to notice that Luminarch of Heish is getting ganged upon by a spellcaster and my chariot, so he's not going to be anything to worry about. Black Orcs managed to get the Demogriff to retreat with the help of the Lord. They are coming back in, but they are not going to last two minutes against these Black Orcs. They've got 50 and they've got five. It's just, it's a no-brainer. They are leaving. Brought my Lord to the middle to help out with this against their Lord. It's only Volkmar, so it's not too much to worry about. But still, you know, you want you want your Lord Jules to be working. Our Orc Ball Boy Biggins finally get around to their artillery. It's going to be shutting one of these units down. I believe I'm about to push one of these units in. I've just popped the wag there just to give us a little bit more speed in chasing these guys down and finishing up this battle. The Arachnorc Spider making full use of that, going straight into uh, those silver bullets and attacking the Luminac behind them. Not going to be too much longer here until we get a full break. The Doom Divers, I should really retarget them because they are chasing to the end of the map, which of course is not very good. But, you know, this battle's going pretty well, so we don't really need to worry about it. Here comes the chain route. And there is a victory. All right, let's look at the stats. As you can see here, the Doom Divers put in a huge amount of work, and so do the Black Orcs. I mean, this one on the left got a little bit ambushed, as did on the right, but the ones that are in the middle got 50 kills apiece, which is really, really good for frontline melee troops, especially in the end game. The Ragnarok Spiders, a few kills each, but they were going after Cav. The Giants didn't get too much work done, but uh, I think it's just because the Black Orcs did too good a job of uh, mopping up before they got there, or they would have got a lot more. Uh, the Doom Divers, but look at that. 100 each, so that's like basically 450 between them. Which is, you know, a huge percentage of their entire army. So yeah, Orcs, they're not too bad. Right, back to you, Miles. Thanks for that, Miles. That concludes this section of the guide on the Greenskin armies. Next time, we'll cover the Lords and Heroes and what they can do both in the campaign and on the battlefield. Thanks for watching this section of my guide. If you want to check out the other parts, there's a link in the card and in the description for a playlist of the series. Don't forget to vote on the poll for the next race you want me to make a guide for, which is linked in the description and the comments. If you enjoyed this video at any point, then please do consider leaving it like as it really does help out a lot. And if you want to see more of this type of video, maybe click that subscribe button to stay up to date. After all, it is free. For now though, I was Colin Dammit, and I'll see you next turn.